So I'm just going around this curvy edge with my Rooney type overcast, whatever it's called, stitch. And when I get to the end, which I think this is the last stitch, I'm going to have to have a little look and see. There we go. What I want to do next, and if I want to disconnect this bit of thread or not. It's only a tiny bit, but I don't want to use it just for the sake of it. Hmm. I'm going to finish it. If, I'm, if it's something doesn't straight away say, yes, you could do this with it, I think the answer is to just finish it off. Right. So I knew I wanted to do some red here, so I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to save that bit there. So at the very least, it will go in the thread nest which is in the stitch scroll video, my thread nest, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Basically, it's a little tin full of ends of thread like that, that I save. Um, and then I use them on my stitch meditation scrolls. Uh, let's get, now this is not six-stranded embroidery floss, this is actually silk that was dyed by, um, not me, but someone else, with, I think, Brazil wood. Oh, someone I did a workshop with, but because it's silk, it's finer than the cotton. So I'm just, I think there's eight strands on here. I don't know, lots. I'm going to risk it for a Swiss kit. I think I've got three there. Wish me luck, but I've done this before. <laughs> I've done it before and it's worked, so I'm hopeful. Pull off three at once, yep. Bingo! The second time I've said bingo. Um, come on in you go. It's got a fluffy end. Well, let's turn the needle around. The lady told me that. And I had never thought of it. I knew it with, obviously, machine sewing needles can only go into machine one way. But the way they go in, they've got a, a bevel to aid with threading on the side that you thread from. But you don't really need to know because, like I said, you know, machine, when you put a new needle in your sewing machine, it's usually got a curved edge and a flat edge and it only goes in one way. But hand sewing needles, apparently, this lady said, I have no reason to doubt her, have a front and a back. So if you can't thread it from one side, turn it around and try the other side. And it worked. It worked. Right. So I'm going to do just this edge, I think. And am I going to think I might do cross stitches? I might get that bit of white out because that's annoying me. There we go. Uh, now you see, you have to when you've got this frayingness, because there's uh, choices to do an along an edge for me would be either just a straight stitch, just inside the edge, you know, a running stitch or do the little Rooney stick, whatever they're called, stitches, or do crosses, which I could do in here, or I could do over, you know, crossing over. If I cross over, I'm going to squash that fluffiness down. So that is where I have to take a view. Oh, also, you could do blanket stitch, but the same thing, you'd squash down the fluffiness. I think I'm going to do crosses, but I'm going to do them in inside and not over the edge. Not to come up in the right place. Poke about till I'm there. There we go. And I'm going to do them individually each cross because they do look different. You know how I did them there where I just did three. I did all the diagonals going that way and then came back because I wanted to go up and ouch, just poke myself. Because I wanted to go up and back with so I was back here to carry on stitching. <clears throat> excuse me, here because I'm just doing one line I'm going to do each cross individually because if I do a long line of diagonals one way and then come back the other way I think it looks different to if you do them individually if you want to know more about all that nonsense and wittering <laughs> about cross stitches and you haven't yet, have a look at the cross stitch video where I talk about it in more detail and with examples 
So I'm not worrying about whether the under diagonal is going the same direction every time, you know, as the over diagonal. I am, however, struggling to find where I'm supposed to come up. I don't think I can do it. Can I do it in one bite? Yes, I can. It's easier in one bite. And so I'm just going where I go, basically. I know I want to cross that, so I'm going to come down there and up there, ready to make the next one. So on some of them, the, the underneath diagonals going from left to right, and on some of them, the underneath diagonals going from right to left. Um, because now I have to do something awkward or turn it round. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something awkward. <laughs> to get myself, when I'm knit, making, knitting, I know you said knitting, when I'm stitching across, I'm kind of visualising on the cloth a little box that the cross is going to sit in. And then obviously each leg of the cross will be in one of the four corners. And I'm not doing that too precisely, in fact I quite like them if they're, oh, here we go. You can just see him in the top corner. He's awake. Here comes trouble with a capital T. We'll see if he's just passing through or if he's really going to get involved. He's just passing through. I can't remember what I was saying now. Was I saying I quite like them all higgledy piggledy? Anyway, I do. Till I was rudely interrupted. Oops. He's going to go and sit on the windowsill because the sun's come out. And uh, my desk is not under the window but to the side of the window. And the sun was making weird shadows so very unfortunately I had to pull the curtain across. And the radiator's also under the window, so he's now behind the curtain in the sun with the radiator under him. He'll probably go back to sleep. <laughs> and sleeping is what he does best. He's not an old cat by any means. He is, how old is he? I think he's three, three or four. Quite young. There we go. Um, but yeah, I just I just prefer the look of them when I stitch them individually than if I do a whole line of diagonals one way and then come back and. But you know, it might be me. It might just be it might be all little things like how I pull the thread and how I make the stitch and so again it's the noticing thing. When next time you're cross stitching, have a play. Um, with doing it different ways, you know, making all your diagonals one way and then coming back and going over them or doing them individually or stab stitching, you know, stab stitching is when you go through like that and that's how you stitch if you were in a hoop and then coming back in two movements or taking it all in one bite in and in and out again See if that makes a difference, you know, whether you're doing cross stitches, running stitches, or whatever. All about the noticing. But I am liking this little bit of red on this dark blue of my old dress. Actually, they're not straight by any means. In fact, they're starting to go a bit downhill. So I'm going to jump slightly back uphill. It would have to really, 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 I'll say it once more, really <laughs> annoy me for me to have to, for me to pull things out. I, I'll nearly do anything rather than pull things out. I would nearly rather stitch something else over the top to hide something. I don't know what it is. 
but you don't like putting things out. I don't think anybody likes to do it, but you know, sometimes you just have to. Oh, he's off again. He's gone. He's left. Fred Fred has left, not the building, but the room. <laughs> Right, I'm going to do one more, whoops, if I can get my needle in, I'm going to do one more and I'm going to not go any further because I don't know what I'm doing yet to my edge. Mm. There we go, I'm going to finish that off. So you see on the back I've got this weird little, and that wouldn't that be nice? Um, to cross stitch on the back. Ooh, just do cross stitching, just stitch on the back and do cross stitches and just see what happened on the front and then you get that which you could almost hardly reproduce. There's an idea. I'm going to go through a couple of times because it's silk so it's quite slippery. I don't want it pulling out. Keep that. Right, so um, like I said when I was doing the assembling, have a little look every now and then just how how it'll look in terms of what you actually will see. I quite like that. Um, I think I'm going to go and do this with the light coloured thread. From the lolly stick. Which makes it a bit kinky, but sometimes... Actually, the outside's not too bad because it's going all round the other thread. Oh, now the dog's coming. There might be wrestling going on in a minute in here. And it's really wrestling, the dog and the cat. They, they're really... <laughs> if you don't know that they're playing and they love each other, really, you might be worried about them. But there's been no harm done so far. And it is always the cat, or nearly always the cat, who starts it. As it starts. No, you're not jumping up on here. Right. Now on this little scrap of my daddy's shirt, I've got these little motifs, that, but they're not completely straight. But what I'm thinking is if I stitch this planar side with the up and down running stitches, then I might do something different over there. So I think I'm going to start at the far side, over here, over here, <clears throat> and do my up and down stitching. What often happens with silk is it curls up. Do my up and down stitching, and then see what I'm going to do when I come to those little crosses and T's. Well, they're both T's, capital T's and small T's, I suppose they are. I don't know what to do with that edge. I'll have to come back later and do something, I think. Uh, it's absolutely not necessary because it's got the you know, the basting stitches through it, and then something will happen here, either blanket stitching or a binding, or I can't, you know, haven't decided yet. So it's secure. It doesn't need anything for structure. It's just if it needs something for visualnessness. So we'll see. In terms of the spacing of my lines of stitching, they just, 
This is just how they are. I don't really think about it anymore. I can't remember if I thought about it in the beginning when I first did that started doing this kind of stitching. Um, you know, if I thought about the spacing. But if you do something for long enough, you get a rhythm. And things become knotted and tangled. No, th things become mum. Instinctive. It's like driving, you know, when you first learn to drive. I have to cast my mind back quite a few years. When you first learn to drive, you have to think about everything all the time, don't you? You have to think about how to change gear if you've got a, what in the UK we call a manual, I think in America you call it a stick shift, is it? Um, but you know, one of, one of those ones where you have to do the clutch pedal and then change the gear rather than the automatic. That coordination to get the clutch when you're first learning to drive is quite tricky to get the hang of. But after many years of driving, you don't even think about it anymore. You can just do it. I suppose it's kind of muscle memory. And it's the same with your stitching, the size of your stitching, the spacing and all that. If you've done enough of it, it'll just kind of... It's like, I think you've got a stitching hand, like you've got a, a writing hand in a way. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I say these things. <laughs> Sometimes they make sense to me. Sometimes it's as though I'm hearing hearing it for the first time. Um, as I'm saying it. Well, I don't know if that makes sense either. <laughs> you know, it's like, sometimes I tell myself a joke. Sometimes I say something and, you know, you sh maybe you shouldn't laugh at yourself, but, I mean, you know, maybe you shouldn't think you're hilarious <laughs> in that way. You should laugh at yourself, of course. You should always never take yourself too seriously. But sometimes I say something and, and it's like I'm hearing it for the first time as I'm, as I'm saying it. Does that happen to you? Please tell me. I'm getting so much reassurance from so many of you saying, yes, I do that. I lick my thread. Um, I know cats who go for walks with their owners. So reassuring. I'm not the only one. I don't know what to do now. I could just go around the edge of that with the sticky Rooney stitches. But that's going to emphasise that that's not straight. And do I want that? Um, I think what I'm going to do actually is go crossways. And I, I'm jumping, and I'm only, but it's only half an inch, so I'm just going to jump. Do you see? get over to there. I think I'm going to go crossways and then down here try and make some crosses but not do it deliberately. Maybe I could do it deliberately. And then here we'll only have the stitches going that way and I'll try and roughly space them so they're more or less between the motifs but not in too much of a controlled kind of stressing over it kind of way. I think that's what I'm going to do. And see what happens. Because even if they've got a little bit of a stitch over them, they'll still pop out because they're such a light colour on such a dark background. See there, it's gone under an angle and I didn't, did I? I don't think I took it all in one go. Just went wonky. Do I mind? I do not. Took a slightly bigger stitch there than maybe I would have done because I wanted to cross that underneath stitch. Now why am I coming? That's all right. Go down, turn around, come back the other way. <clears throat> I'm going to go slightly out. And I'm just off the motif, so that was a result that I don't think I really planned. 
what this does as well is it really embeds, especially when it's something fine like silk, but even a thin, a thinnish cotton, really em it's kind of embeds it, it melds it, meld is a good word, it melds it with the undercloth. So they really become one. And I just like that, the feeling of that. And I'm just the other side of the motif. Again, more luck than judgment, as they say. a shorter space underneath so I can cross that stitch. But you see what I mean about letting it out and, and also controlling it a bit <laughs> if you feel like it. You're the boss of it. Process focused and all that doesn't mean, you know, entirely giving up control, or at least I don't think it does. It's more about noticing, but I think that's the important thing while you're actually doing the making of whatever it is because it's you know you can be process focused in, in anything certainly all creative things it's noticing now I'm going to I haven't gone right over the edge of that bit of silk, but that's the outer part of that curve, so I'm going to stay in it a bit. And there's nothing wrong with that curve, really, really and truly. But apparently it's bothering me somewhat, because I think that's the third time I've mentioned it. Something about it. Have I got enough thread to get to the end? I don't think I have. Oh dear. I don't know if you could hear that, but that's the big dog with a hairball. It hasn't been that cold here yet. Um, once or twice there's been a morning frost, but it's been more sort of mild and rainy. And his hair is, he, well, he seemed to molt once, and he does a big molt. And, you know, kind of an autumn or fall molt. And then his hair grew back in. Well, he doesn't go, you know, doesn't lose it completely. <laughs> but you know what I mean, at times of year, if you've got dogs or cats, at times of year, or horses. Um, they shed more than others, and they're changing their coats. But it seems that it, it's he's, he grew it back and it seems that he's now losing it again, and I don't know if that's just because he's so old, or because he's out of sync, because the seasons are a bit weird. I don't know. But then sometimes he pulls it himself, you know, I do give him regular brushings. He loves it apart from anything else. But sometimes he pull he pulls at his loose hair and then he gets like like a cat getting a hairball. And you probably couldn't even hear him, <laughs> so I'm explaining a sound that you can't hear, but he was going, eh, you know, you know that sound that they make if you've got animals. Right, that's that thread used up. I need to get a bit more. Sorry, random singing. Random singing. Are there three there? That would be strange. No, there's four. One was hiding. Sometimes there are three because I've pulled off a single strand for some reason. So, therefore, making an odd number. Or, you know, 
pulled off three strands or five strands. But I don't think that was the case here because I cut the whole six strands off the thingy. Thingy doodad. I got away with it again. Um, some threads, I don't really find it with embroidery thread, but I do sometimes find it with the cotton pearl, pearl, pearl A, however you say it. I have a, a way, I have a, you know, like velvet has a pile, or, or any cloth with long fibres has a pile, or a carpet has a pile. Some threads have a, the way they're twisted, so if you stitch with them one way through your needle, you know, like if I make this my short end, and stitch that way. It can be different when you're stitching than if you. I hope this. I hope you're following my my logic here. Than if you have it that way. And if you some especially with vintage threads that you might have one-offs, so you can't really get to know you know a brand of thread or, or type of thread or whatever. If you find it tangling and knotting when you're stitching with it that way, try and take it the other way if you follow what I'm saying. Because it can be that there's it's the way it's twisted that the twists are lying and you want to stitch with the twists rather than against them. I have found that. I have found that sometimes to be the case with thread and I think I've bought some lovely vintage thread and I'm using it and I'm thinking, oh gosh, I love this thread but it's being a nightmare. It's being a problem child. And then I've tried stitching with it the other way, and it's been fine. And that is, has been my deduction as to why. Right, I've got maybe two more lines in this. Maybe three. And then, and then, and then. I shall call this side done. I'm going to do the other side. And I still haven't decided which is the front and which is the back. But I don't have to decide yet, it's fine. Everything in its time. See there, I just, and now I have not controlled that, but just by sheer luck. I'm under that little motif. And like I said, it really didn't matter if I'd stitched over them. I didn't really try and avoid it, but it's just part of that paying attention, noticing. Um, now to come back the other way, I'm going to have to... I might just get away. Now I'm going to control it after saying I haven't done. <laughs> Do it like that. Fell at the final hurdle of control or not. Right, there we go. Before I cut that, I always have a look because otherwise you cut it and then you look and you go, oh, I could have just taken a few more there. Or, um, In fact, what I think I might want to do is I think I'm just going to do a line of stitches just around there, just outside of it, just for fun. Um, like a little frame around it. So I'm going to come down there and off the corner a bit, somewhat. Now I'm probably about three sixteenths or something like that away from the edge. And I don't know why I decided to do this, but it popped into my head, so I went with it. Don't do that. There we go. Um, if I planned ahead, I would have started or stopped somewhere here. Well, that would have been, uh, you couldn't have done that either, could you? Because then you'd have had to work that way and that way. Right. So anyway, I'm going to, I want to jump over there. I'm going to, it's quite a long way to go in one leap, so I'm going to take a little bite halfway, just of a back stitch, which will just mean that that's anchored and that's, if there's a great big long strand, it might affect your tension at one point. 
just to explain that there is method in my madness. And this row of stitching is hardly visible to me. Can you see that just above my thumb? But even if it's virtually invisible, you do kind of know it's there. She said, trying to justify her reasons for doing it. Here she comes, tick ticking on the floor. Hello. And I really can't see it. Same thing applies when you go around a corner. I often go through and then come back in a new movement. Um, I'm just going to follow this very wobbly line of the edge of that cloth. But I'm just going to follow it. Yeah, because even if you don't actually see, you know, if the colour of the thread matches the cloth as it does here, pretty much. You do Stiles! Stiles, stop it! Sorry, she's having a scratch and then she's shaking her head. Um, even if it completely matches, that's what I was saying, it, um, you see the texture, even if you don't see the stitch, she said. Can you see? Alright, so... Side two, we already did that one. We. The royal we. I already did that one. Um, what else do I want to do on side two? I don't want to do, I'm just trying to tie a knot at the same time as I'm talking. I don't want, I like that, this frayedness, so I don't want to do anything about that. I'm thinking this quite thin strip. I'm just thinking I might just do some big crosses. Let's do that. Just a little line of... Um, now, when I say crosses, I could either do, you know, cross stitch diagonal crosses, or I could do T-shaped T crosses. And I don't know which to do. I think I'm gonna go with the diagonal ones. And again, it's basted all the way around, so I don't need to worry about holding the edges down, especially. Just going to go by eye. I don't know how many I'm going to fit, if I'm going to fit an even number or an odd number or anything like that. It's exciting, isn't it? The unknown. Um, I think I'm going to have some space between them just to be different. Yes, I'm pleased with that decision. I'm quite liking those. Two. And the thumb smooshing. Three, four, five. I think I'm going to get five. So now I can, if I want to, play about a little bit with the size of the crosses and the spacing so that they're all roughly the same size and the spaces are roughly the same. But I can wiggle a bit to make sure I fit my five in a reasonably pleasing way. So I've done three, so I have one more there, between there and there, and a space. Yeah, that's going to work out. Just dandy. Just fine and dandy -o. I think. I hope. Yep. And I've got an odd number which makes me happy. And there's slightly more room at the top than there was at the bottom. But actually visually it's pretty much the same because the bottom's got a lot more fraying. There we go. Um, let's finish that off.
It's alright, I felt like I'd gone too far in, but it was fine. Okie dokie, okie dokie. So I need to do something here. And I'm wondering if I want to do something in red there. Um, because I don't think I just want that to be the only red. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm going back to the dark colour, the dark blue, the dark side. <clears throat> Is that it? Yep. It looked lighter laying there, but that's it. Pull off two. See if we can get away with it again. But do you, can you see what might happen when I'm pulling like that? As it's twisting up here. That's when you can get in a knot on your... Yep. Wait for it. Bingo! Come on, I haven't had any trouble today, really threading my needle. Oh. No, only one's gone through again. You get slapdash, you get slapdash and then it doesn't work. So yeah, I, take, I took my cardi off, if you remember. <laughs> I don't know how many hours ago. <laughs> how long have I been sitting here? Oh dear. Uh, that's why I thought it would be nice to make this a three-parter and make the middle part an optional extra for those who like to sit and crochet or stitch or knit or whatever while I'm wittering on and doing something that isn't really that interesting or not, well, hopefully it's a bit interesting but it's not crucial to the whole project. Um, so anyway, however long ago that was that I was too warm, I'm now cold, so I have to put my cardi back on. Excuse me one moment, cardied up. I've got only got a thinnish cotton three-quarter sleeve thingy bob on otherwise. Right, um, mm -mm -mm. what shall we do? See, when I fold that like that, I just love that fluff there. So I definitely, definitely don't want to stitch that down. And I'm thinking this might well be the front. Because I like the curve and I like this. So what do I want to do there? Do I just want to do some more straight up and down stipe? Ah, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the straight stitching one way and the other way, but I'm going to go over this patch and then I'm going to carry on like that. Whoops, as if the patch carried as if the patch was this size. And then I'm going to crossway that way. That's what I'm going to do. And then you'll kind of get hopefully two different effects. It'll be the same stitching over the whole area um, but over this dark cotton it'll be dark obviously dark on dark so you won't see it as much but then when you see it on the grey it'll be more visible oh dear me oh dear that's a serious serious knot pick at it there we go There we go, there we go, there we go. I say that a lot as well, there we go, there we go. You realise when you, I don't watch my, when I'm editing I kind of skip through, but I try and make sure that I've made sure, made sure that I've made sure. <laughs> um, do not adjust your sound, it's just me saying the same words over and over again. Make sure that I've made sure that it's right and I'm not spouting up utter nonsense. Um, but I sort of skip, you know, skip through. And I've forgotten the point of what I was telling you. Uh, when I come to edit, I now worked out how to put text over, which I did because I wanted to tell you who wrote The Incredible Journey and um, 
with that video where I talked about incredible. Oh, the other, yeah, it was the other stitch journal. Because as I've said before, I'm not a technological whiz. But anyway, I worked out how to put a little texty caption thing on the screen. So when I edit, if I see what I forgot, I'll put it as a caption. Otherwise it's gone forever. It's lost forever in my brain, never to be seen again. Now it's possible, because this keeps snagging, that maybe I've got it. I was talking about which way around. You can also with a cloth, sometimes the cloth pulls up the thread in a different way and makes it tangle. But do, you, do you see what I'm meaning? Do you see what I meant? I'm just going to do that all the way up. And see how it looks. I might actually just leave it going only this one way. I'll see when I've done it and take a view. But I do know that I do, I'm pretty sure I want to put a little touch of red somewhere on this side. But it might just be a teeny weeny little touch of it somewhere. We'll see. But it's just, you know, when I was making, doing a lot of machine work, um, I basically I started doing handwork when I was very young, as a child. Granny's, granny's flower garden, hexagons, English paper piecing, or, you know, just kind of patchworky type things. And then um, as an adult, I picked it back up again, maybe in my twenties, and I taught myself to hand quilt, you know, proper hand quilting. With a, I used a, a wooden frame, the, the circly ones that you put at the side of your chair and got all obsessed with how many stitches per inch I was getting and, you know, all that hand quilting. And then I discovered machine work and um, I started and I taught myself to do free motion quilting or free motion embroidery on a domestic sewing machine, not on a long arm. And I really loved that. I really, for a long time, enjoyed doing that. It was um, it was very liberating, uh, kind of creatively, to, to paint with a sewing machine. So I did that for a long time. And um, I joined a group in the UK, a couple of groups actually, of other textile people, and got involved in some exhibitions, both on my own and in groups with other people. And, but gradually, gradually, and, and through that I made more sort of art quilts rather than, you know, uh, functional quilts. And um, gradually, gradually, hand stitching started creeping back in. So I would piece wall hangings on a sewing machine and do some machine quilting on them. And then I would find myself picking them up and putting hand stitching back in. And gradually the hand stitching just took took over just took over again and uh, machine stitching went completely out of the window and I've still got my so I'm actually down to three sewing machines before we left England in 2017 I had seven or eight sewing machines they were not all brand new um, in fact only two of them were I had bought new one was the first one I bought when I first started quilting and piecing. Um, and then the second one I've still got, which is my genome or genomi, however you want to pronounce it, um, with the wide throat, you know, the one I bought for doing free motion machine quilting. It's got that the throat is between where it stands and the bit that the needle comes out of. That space in there, mine's 11 inches instead of the standard whatever. And it's sunk into a table, and, a, and that was quite a big investment at the time, and I've still got it, and it's brilliant. Although I use it now mostly for mending my horse's rugs, <laughs> um, which is a little bit, um, you know, overkill on the, on, the, um, on the expense. You wouldn't buy it just for that, but anyway, it's very good for that. And I do sometimes make things, or stitch things together, or uh, use it to stitch on pages for junk journals, things like that. But anyway, what am I telling you about? My sewing machines. So I had that one. I had the first one I bought and I had that one. 
Um, I've got a treadle that I bought in England that works. That's actually standing in my bedroom. Um, there's not really room in here for it. You know, a singer treadle that you do with your feet, which I can free motion on. I did, um, I did have a go, and you can. You can't drop the feet. If you know what I'm talking about, if you're a machine quilter, um, you can't drop the feed dogs. If you're not a machine quilter or a, a, you don't have a sewing machine or you don't know about sewing machines, the feed dogs are those little toothy things that, that come up underneath and keep everything going in a straight line. And if you want to do free machine quilting, you don't want to be in a straight line. You want to be able to wiggle about. So a lot of modern machines, you can there's a little lever and you can drop the feed dogs down so they don't keep everything going straight. But on old machines, and even on my treadle, if you stick something over the feed dogs, something thin, I use something like, you know, those sort of laminated loyalty cards or um, membership cards that, expire, that have expired. You know, that thin, it's thin, but it's laminated, so it's sturdy. I'll just take that over. And I could free motion on the treadle. I was, I was quite pleased. I didn't do it a lot. I just really did it to prove it was possible. Because <laughs> I used to teach free motion. And I would have people say, oh, I can't free motion because my machine is, um, you know, I need a, I need a all bells and whistles fancy machine to do it. So it was kind of a way to demonstrate that you did not need a fancy machine. Um, but maybe that was just hype from people who were trying to sell you a fancy machine. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, so that's my textile journey, really, that began when I was about eight or nine, I suppose, with Auntie Lily teaching me how to knit, and my mother made a lot of clothes for myself and herself, and Auntie Lily did some dressmaking, and my grandmother did a lot of knitting, and some dressmaking, I think, um, and my mum's sister, my Auntie Julie, also is very crafty. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, she's very good at crafty things. She's one of those people that can, like, just reupholster things. And, you know, she can just look at something and know how to do it. She's got that kind of brain. They, I don't know if they still have a caravan, but they were very keen caravanners, holiday caravanning. And so they were by sort of maybe a, a caravan that had maybe got knocked about a bit, so to speak. And my Auntie Julie would redo all the upholstery and make new curtains and just make it all wonderful. But I've always been around, as I'm sure many of you have, um, women primarily that have done tech, something with textiles. And this piece of thread has nearly run out and that was my voice. <clears throat> Sorry. I need another bit. But it's interesting that I started with hand stitching, got lured into the world of machine stitching. And um, now I'm back to hand stitching again. It's like I've come full circle. But I do believe that everything I've done over the years all has played a part in forming how I work now all of those experiences. And who's to say that I don't at one point go back to machining? I, I can't imagine it at this moment, but I think really sometimes you just can't imagine, can you? Can't imagine what's, how you might feel at one point. I used to, I started with liking the real grungy, vintagey type colors. Although when I first started, I was buying new new cloth, but I was buying all the you know the cl the new cloth that looked old and grungy. And then I went through a phase of doing very bright colours, like primary primary colours. Got some pieces hanging in here. Um, one day I might do a studio tour, and then you'll see some of my older machiney pieces. But there's some here that are very bright colours that don't look like me at all now. If this, this was all you knew about me, this YouTube channel, you would not believe that that work was mine. <clears throat> and so I've gone, went from grungy to bright and now I've gone back to grungy. <laughs> it 
face change. Um, oh dear, I should have started there. Anyway, luckily I'm more or less in line. <laughs> but now I'm going to have to jump. You see what I did? I stopped there and then I went and started there and stitched back because I was wittering on about colours bright and otherwise. I'm going to finish it off. It's just too too far to go. That'll learn me. That'll learn ya. Oh, dee dee. And then, when I've done that, um, probably one more line. Uh, I think I'm going to do one more line, and that will bring me not quite to the edge. And then in order to just do something on the edge, on the edge, living on the edge, that might be my pop of red. I might do a little line of red, either cross stitches or the little sticky rune stitches that don't have the stitch with no name. Not that I can find, anyway. And then, I think I'm going to call it done. And I have no idea how long I've been sitting here. Or how long this video is going to be. But I am really trying to um, make videos that some are, you know, more reasonably short and very sort of project focused, but in the process focusedness of slow stitch. Because um, I don't want to be something I'm not. Um, where's my bit of red? There we go. No, that wasn't it. Um, yeah, and, and, and some of these long wittery ones. <laughs> Uh, I think that's too short. I'm not going to risk it. I'm going to get a new bit. Um, because some of you like the wittery ones. So I don't want to disappoint you. I have to get that out of there because I haven't got another needle up here that I want to use. They're all... Oh, no, I have. I don't mind. I have. I just spied my little... Oh, needle cushion. Just had a message saying my battery's going to run out. So hopefully, 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 I can get to the end. Now I feel I'm under pressure and have to rush, and that is not what we want at all. Right. So if at one point there's a little jump, it'll be because the battery ran out. I do want to keep an eye because I. I want to make sure that um, I don't have to unpick it and do it again because the battery's run out. Yeah, so what was I saying? Um, yeah, so I'm trying to... So that's why I thought if I do part one and part three as the actual real how to how to make the, the journal thing, then um, this middle part two can be for those of you that like listening to me witter. I'm just doing some teeny, teeny little, just for that pop of red. And this is quite thick, this under denim, this, this denim here. And there's that, and then under under that there's more denim. So I'm only going through the, the cotton and this first layer of denim until I get to the end and then I'm going to go right through to the back. Like a zoo. Like a zoo. And have a look at my battery situation. Ooh, the pressure. The pressure. There we go. And I think I'm happy with that. So just to reiterate, we'll leave, I, I am leaving the spine. Um, till later on, probably till the book's made, um, 
but I think it's going to be that way. So that's going to be the front, like that. That's going to be the back, and that's going to be the spine. So it'll be a chunky little cubey book. So, okay, so I've been looking at this and, um, excuse me, I, um, it looks unfinished <laughs> to me with all that unstitchedness. Uh, so apart from the spine, which I'm deliberately leaving to be embellished later, I am going to put some more straight stitching on the, the front and back covers. Um, and I am going to do that off camera because I've already got about three hours of video, I think, and we're nowhere near done. Um, so I will have to do some editing as well. Don't all shout at me. You don't want to watch me for hours and hours and hours and hours, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> I've also, at the same time, got this for the inside. So I've just cut a whole piece of some denim, which is very fine. It came from a shirt. And inside I've put a little bit of wadding, which just happens to be black because it was just a scrap left over from something, um, batting, I, think, I do believe you call it, over the pond, um, with the ubiquitous cat hair. Um, so I'm just going to use that, it's quite thin and soft, but just to add a little bit of structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the stitching on this, probably just straight lines. Sorry, I've done that naughty thing again of pulling it towards me so you can't see. Probably just some straight lines all the way through, maybe missing out the odd decorative bit, both there and there. And then, when I've done that, I'm going to stitch this to just the wadding slash batting. If you don't have wadding slash batting, you could use, if you've got a bit of old blanket or some felt, or a kind of a thickish brush cotton, or you know, just something. You could even, if you didn't have that and you had some ugly fabric that you didn't want to use elsewhere, or some old sheet, put two or three layers, just so it was the thickness that you wanted. When you put, you know, in the spirit of, of Cantha, where they layered saris together to make a new, a new cloth. So there's always a solution. But just then try it with whatever solution you, you've come up with. Try it, just hold the three together like that and um, just see how it feels. And that feels quite nice. And I may then decide, I've cut already, I may or may not use some cardboard inside. I'll see when I get there. I probably will definitely use the spine, the cardboard in the spine. I'm not sure yet about the covers. So I'm going to go and do that stitching, which will take me probably a few hours. And then I'll come back and show the rest. <laughs> 